moving on to the next session i think for me the most awaited because it's called it's it's a different format than what we have seen since morning and uh, vikas and ajay who's been the brain child in one way you know uh, called this a fish bowl situation and i asked him why fish bowl he said so far the interactions that you have seen is people coming on the on the dais and talking among themselves but i think the next session promises an interaction with all of us it's going to be highly interactive session so a fish ball which is which is round which has single fish and and the environment around it and the fish is interacting okay, around you, with the environment so awesome. is the situation which is going to be created next and that single fish is the person whom i'm about to introduce next he second thing that vikas shared with me is before requesting this person to come over and talk about things he said can you share the vision of 2020 and he said 2020 is very predictable let me go a little beyond that and 2030 could be probably set the right vision so um, the gentleman uh, he's he's the global citizen he's traveled in 56 countries i wonder what happens to his passport by the time he lands it's he has to send that for renewal he's born in zimbabwe he studied in australia he's worked in hong kong singapore and thailand for the last 16 years he's written seven books and he's the only westerner in asia who's been certified by edward de bono the lateral thinking guru he's among the world's top 100 favorite travel writers he's also done something that i'm doing today at tedx which if you're aware of he's the master of ceremony there in tedx he's managed change management at pacific asia travel association and he's a great storyteller and by the way he's currently leading an organization which is called travel daily media he's a publisher there and we are talking none other than stuart lloyd ladies and gentlemen please join me welcome stuart lloyd Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to you and thank you so much to Vikas and your fantastic team for having me along today. It's uh, certainly a thrill to be here. Um and I and I'm certainly has proved to be the longest day. We started in 2013 and now we find ourselves in 2030. So welcome. Now, uh the world is changing at an unprecedented rate. For example, it took Britain 155 years from 1870 to double its per capita GDP. Then came USA and Germany who managed to do that with slightly larger populations in between 30 to 60 years. And now comes India and China who are doubling per capita GDP. in a tenth of the time with at least 100 times the populations so this is really very very exciting times in fact it'd be much more exciting times if i could have the uh, clicker so i can advance my uh, slides yeah somebody have a clicker it's all in the preparation <laughs> can i uh, yeah i know now as promised this will be a uh, an interactive session for sure i'm going to set the scene a little bit thank you good sir uh let me see techno that should go forward yes beautiful all right now what's happening is very very exciting we're now in 2030 let's have a look at what's happening and for the first time now what we're seeing you can see china and india there moving ahead catching up with and in fact overtaking the US and the EU in what we call the traditional four component power forecast and this measures the economy the population the military and the size of technological investment and asia has not been in this position folks since the year 1500 
That's why the subtitle of my talk this afternoon is Let's Party Like It's 1499. <laughs> okay? However, have a read of this quote from the US National Intelligence Committee. So they're talking about radical transformation from our world today. So where do we get answers from when we have to seek answers? Of course, we always go to sports stars, don't we? <laughs> Does anybody recognize who this guy is on the screen? Give you a clue, he's clearly an ice hockey player. Actually, Wayne Gretzky from Canada, world's top ice hockey player. Yeah. So why the hell am I asking advice from an ice hockey player about tourism in India? Because Wayne Gretzky had a really good quote when they asked him, Mr. Gretzky, what is the secret of your brilliance? He says, I don't skate towards where the puck is. I skate towards where the puck is going to be. So this afternoon, I don't uh, pretend to know what the future holds for us. I barely know what's going to happen this weekend, <laughs> right? I will admit. However, predicting the future is too impossible. But what I can give you this afternoon and what we will share in the next uh, few minutes is an aggregated framework, a lens through which we can view some very likely scenarios for uh, what's coming down the track for us. Very, very exciting times. Now, this is where it gets eco uh, economic. This is where it gets interactive. Um, I've got four topics on there. In fact, let's... Uh, sorry, one, two, three, four, correct. Um, a show of hands, who would be more interested in spending more time talking about the macroeconomic drivers of these change? Who would be more interested in talking about the new shape of the outbound industry and the opportunities within the outbound industry? And who would like to spend more time talking about the black swan events? So firstly, can we see for one, who's interested in macroeconomic? Okay. Who's interested in uh, number two, the new shape of the outbound industry? Okay, good. And black swan events? One. Oh, sorry, okay. A black swan event is, uh, oh, it's buzz talk. It means uh, the downside events, possible negative scenarios, things that can derail this whole damn process, ruin our party. <laughs> that's uh, black swan. And uh, time travel, uh, that's uh, a bit of fun stuff. We can maybe have a bit of Q&A on that later. Okay, fine. So let's get started then. Uh, in terms of the macroeconomics, now I think we've done a a fine job this afternoon with JB in your talk. You covered a lot of good stuff. In fact, you went past 2030, 2031. <laughs> right. So there is uh, some similar material which I've, uh, I've researched as well. well. We'll skip through that. But most exciting for India, I think, is this. And it's called the demographic window of opportunity. Because, you know, we can talk all we like about market segments and brochures versus this and that. None of that actually really matters. And I think uh, Ratna put it very well this morning, which is, says, you know, there's no point talking about market segments if you haven't got a market. Now, let's look at this. Now, according to the UN demographers, every country has a window of opportunity. And that window is when you have less than 30% of your population as 14-year-old and under as children, and less than 15% as 65 year and old seniors. Okay, so very exciting there. You can see India. Window of opportunity, 2015 to 2050. So we've got 35 possibly brilliant years as our historical window of opportunity on our doorstep coming very, very soon. So that's the first exciting thing which I'm going to share with you. Now the next one, and this is uh, from the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. They have a thing called a sweet spot. I like this terminology, a sweet spot. And um, what is a su uh, sweet spot? Is really talking about the power of the middle class. 
all right? When you have people in their millions moving out of poverty into middle class, middle class being defined as $10 uh, per day earnings, yeah? And, uh, and basically what happens with that, as people move into the middle class, so they produce, so they consume, and they then create more people into the middle class, and so it becomes a virtuous circle, all right? And India is predicted to hit that sweet spot in the year 2017. Okay, so this is all coming soon. Uh, you can see it visually there. Look at the middle class. Just absolutely, um, it's just started and just begins to climb vertically from there. Uh, a tectonic shift is how it's been uh, described. All right, but the middle class is, you can see there, at the moment you have about 50 million people in India classified as middle class. By 2030, you can see down the bottom left, you will have 475 million classified as middle class. Now, why is this exciting? Why am I, why am I suddenly becoming an economics professor here? For the simple reason that middle class is really the biggest catalyst and the biggest predictor of travel. It's the first thing people want to do when they've got a dollar in their pocket. They want to see what's, uh, what's out there for me in this big, wide, wonderful, beautiful world. Okay? So every one of you that's here today in the travel and tourism business should be very, very excited about that. Okay? India, China. You know, people always talk about them as a two-horse race and this and that. A lot of people try to oversimplify it by saying, what's your Chindia strategy? As if China and India somehow are one homogenous market. No, they're not. It's been touched on a bit earlier today. Two completely separate markets. And do you know what? In this race, India is better positioned. Because median age. You're a lot l uh, younger on average uh, than China. Okay? And that proportional uh, thing will remain for the next 20 years. So very, very well positioned in terms of age. Here's an important thing. India's future is in its cities. Okay? Uh, at the moment, you have something like 10% of your population is urbanized. By 2030, that will be 41%. And 75% of the people living in your cities will be classified as middle class. Okay? So um, big, big pockets of money there. And the column on the right, and if anybody would like a copy of these, uh, please email me after the, uh, you know, after the uh, event today, and I'll be happy to send you these, because I don't want to get bogged down in the fine print and blah, blah, blah. Yeah? But just to excite you with uh, why India has got to be happening uh, for the next uh, years. Look at that. Per capita income. Woo, up she goes. Up by four times. So anyone here working for a boss, go and ask for pay rise tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> Let's start the progress. Prove me right, please. <laughs> Actually, the other reason I chose to go with 2030 instead of 2020 is that I, uh, I thought that's more safe for me because by the time you know I'm wrong, uh, I'm a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's now talk about the outbound market and there's a lot of interest in the room in this whole thing about where, you know, where does the outbound market go from here? What does it mean for me as an operator, tangibly? Uh, a good quote here from David Brett, uh, who's based there in Bangkok with us, um, Amadeus. And he says, India represents the emerging giant of the Asia-Pacific travel market as the number of Indian travelers will grow exponentially over the next 20 years. And I'll give you some numbers on that in a moment. Just have a look at that. There's uh, Asia-Pacific, which is the, um, the middle bar of that. Actually, the fastest growing outbound region up till 2030, yeah? So anybody that's in outbound, there you go. No excuse. <laughs> South Asia, more specifically. And really, South Asia these days is increasingly just becoming India. You know, as our neighbors are not uh, performing so well. Uh, uh, you know, really, when you look at anything with South Asia now, it's, it's pretty much, uh, it's India. Up 8.1% over the next 20 years. Yeah? Each year, that is. Yeah? Compounding. Yeah? Uh, so it is the fastest growing region. Uh, this uh, slide we saw before, I won't labor that point. Um, here we come from Amadeus. They say we anticipate at least a six-fold increase in outbound travelers from India over the next 20 years. So if you see that that number at the moment, I think, is about 13 million? Yes. Yep. Okay. So multiply by six. 
Hey, this is supposed to be interactive. We've got two mathematicians here. What about the rest of you? Did you get the same answer? Do we need multiple choice? Do you want to phone a friend? What do you want to do? <laughs> okay, so big, big numbers. I've seen, um, I've seen much more optimistic uh, forecasts than that, but I think we're generally agreed, which is why I've gone with this number, that a six-fold increase would be um, prudent. Now, I believe, and I've seen enough research uh, over the years to show that travel follows trade. Can we agree on that in this room? Does anyone have a different point of view? Travel follows trade. So wherever there's trade, the tourism to those markets will follow. Could it be? Great. 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 I'm throwing hooks out here. Good. You're biting. Good. <laughs> yeah? Coexist? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, but, but historically you're absolutely right. When they thought the earth was flat and they set out on their, on their journeys and uh, you know, discovered that in fact the world wasn't flat and there was all sorts of opportunities there, etc. So travel certainly happened before trade. Now, however, we, we can just jump on the internet. We don't have to travel there. We can just do it on eBay or we can place an order, you know, we can place an order to Scotland or something like that. So it's, it's a different paradigm, yeah? But Sure, I think it, it does work both ways. I'm pinning much more on this though, which is travel follows trade. So what's the implication for India there? If you have a look, not much change. I mean, in terms of the top five trading partners for India, not much change, um, but the batting order is changed, yeah? So UAE is there, and I'll show you in a moment the rate of growth for these markets. It's quite interesting. UAE is there and will continue to be there. Um, suddenly Vietnam is coming there. Let's have a look at the, uh, the next slide, yeah? And this will, uh, there you go. Fastest growing will be Vietnam at 15%. So I hope uh, you're all sending an urgent text to your offices and say, hey, get the Vietnam brochure out. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so Vietnam coming through big. Now, interesting here is China, because China, 15% on what's already a very large base is significant. Um, then you have Malaysia, Turkey, our ambassador friend has uh, is gone back already, Indonesia, uh, and that's a very booming market as somebody uh, mentioned. So uh, then comes uh, the Middle East, and obviously the ties with the Middle East are very strong and traditional and um, multifaceted. Um, Bangladesh is an interesting one, and I don't know what your viewpoint on Bangladesh is, because here I see this prediction at 11% growth. I read something else last week, and Bangladesh was very high on their list of probable failed states in the next 20 years. So I don't know, is anyone here doing business with Bangladesh, doing trading tourism with, yeah? Right, okay. And you're finding that market's performing for you at the moment? It does, but, there is, um, it does, but they have these, uh, their economics is not really mature. They have their, uh, still have to develop their uh, financial character <coughs> of trading and sending money out of the country and receiving money in the country. So they have those challenges still now. Mm. But they are doing it through Calcutta. Yeah. Okay, good. There right. is a perception. Once upon a time, Bangladesh was, was pretty high on the list of a very simple reason. Because that was the only place uh, <coughs> you could do. It was a non-quota country. So you got to, you know, people used to take cotton there, take garments and send it out. Uh, <coughs> but the dynamics have changed. and. Uh, I mean, like with all due respect of your beautiful presentation, the travel will not follow trade, especially for Bangladesh. But, but uh, Istanbul is a different, uh, Turkey is a different ball game. There was a huge amount of trade which is going on, and now we see a lot of travel happening to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Good. And then UAE, I say 11% on what's already your biggest uh, trade partner, uh, is obviously very, very significant. And uh, there's Canada as well, yeah. So, uh, 
Please. Uh, while uh, I agree with you that travel would follow trade to a large extent, but there are other factors which determine travel. For example, once the uh, road to Thailand opens up by Myanmar, mm -hmm. you will see a whole lot of travel happening by road from yes. India, which yes. is 10, 15 years later, much before 2030. Even though the trade to Myanmar may not be that high, but you see a lot more travel happening to Myanmar <coughs> and to Thailand. You're absolutely right. Good, uh, yeah, good, good point. And overland travel is certainly not to be uh, not to be underestimated. Even the sea route, Stuart Burnham from Andamans, from Andamans, the sea route when it opens, mm -hmm. you can see there are lots of travel. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes, up the back. Uh, Stuart, I think uh, sometimes person images can be very misleading. Not sometimes, uh, always. <laughs> we talk in absolute numbers. Yeah. I mean, Vietnam has a growth number. Very low. Yeah, very good point. And I, I flagged obviously where I believe that uh, countries are coming off a small base versus uh, ones that are coming off a larger base. But you know, what's significant about there is okay, Vietnam is at the top of that list. Uh, and it, as I made an appearance here for the first time. So that to me signals, I mean, this is very, very macro, uh, broad brushstroke stuff. It just signals to me, if I was in, uh, in this business, I would say, okay, great, let's, let's have a look at Vietnam. As I say, we're just talking about how can we help your business skate towards where that future ball is going to be so you can intercept the ball and pop it in the goal. Entirely agree with you. Uh, it's, it's a good point. Certainly what I didn't want to get uh, done this afternoon is bogged down in spreadsheets. Um, so I'm, I'm really just keeping it very broad and very uh, what I call the 35,000 foot view. Yeah. Um, but uh, all valid points. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from Amadeus, they're saying the preferred future destinations in 2030 for business travelers will be, let's say, Singapore, Malaysia, and China. Okay. And for leisure travelers, there's Singapore again. Malaysia's in there. And who mentioned Thailand before? There you go. So. So that's interesting. There's uh, a few markets that if you're not involved with at the moment, you might give some thought to. Yeah, but Singapore is not a very expensive, it's already becoming a very expensive market for leisure. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously going to continue to decline. Do you think it's a very expensive destination for India to market as a leisure destination? As compared to Malaysia and Thailand, it's almost double the quality. Sure. So they've been living in Singapore and Malaysia for a week. It's very expensive. Yeah, I know. I lived there for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is how does it maintain that number one spot? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because I understand that numbers of leisure to um, Singapore has already dipped up till now because the thing is a, a big attraction for Indian travelers to go to India, as, as Indian travelers to go to Singapore rather, is to see a, a modern, you know, a modern city that's almost like a western city, yeah? yeah. Right, but now, but now you have the skyscrapers and stuff in Delhi. You don't have to do that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so really, I think your question is more financial. Is that if it's so damned expensive, uh, why is it still going to be popular? Well, I'm going to get to the thing of the high net worth individual later. That might be something, but that, that won't give you the volumes, of course. It won't give you volumes. Um, but that's interesting. I mean, look, it's close enough. I think there's proximity. And proximity is uh, certainly as people start to travel for the first time, second time, third time, they radiate out, they ripple out um, further afield. Um, yeah, look, this is a good question which I will pose back to Amadeus. Also from southern uh, India, excuse me, also from southern India, yeah. Singapore and Malaysia is a big travel. Oh, that's a very good point, yeah, exactly, from, uh, from, from southern India, so from maybe from the new Air Asia hub. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, I think there's one more point about Singapore. Yes, please. I, 
one of the few destinations which keep reinventing itself. Every six months, you see a new campaign happening. Yeah. They have a fantastic marketing program. Reinvention marketing. Re reinventing. And also, if you visit Singapore six months later, you find a whole range of new activities, new places. Yes. So there are a lot of learning from Singapore for other destinations. Yeah, I think we can all learn a hell of a lot. Um, Singapore is a little bit like a pop star with longevity. You know, somebody like Madonna or something. Yeah. All right? Every six months, new hairstyle. Hey, <laughs> I know about these things. Trust me. <laughs> but, you know, new fashion, new sound, new thing. And you keep current, yeah? Very validly what Mr. Chanel Bhandari also said, that Singapore Airlines is a huge, uh, you know, catalyst also. They're increasing their flights and other connections via Singapore thereby encouraging the customer to land in Singapore either way. Like Emirates is doing. Yeah. And they call Both it like yeah. Emirates and Singapore Airlines are second, our first carriers, you know, yeah. for example. Yeah. So there are about 100 flights going across a week. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good point. And uh, he's just mentioned Singapore is a, a sort of a, a, a transshipment sort of or layover. Yeah, I haven't spoke. And uh, one of the big reasons uh, for Singapore's popularity might well be India already enjoys a massive VFR market yes. because of your diaspora, right? I think something like 100 million Indians already living overseas, primarily in Australia, UK, US. Yeah, in yeah, Singapore as well. Vivek your son's in Singapore, right? Vivek contemporary, there's a change, as we said, you know, every six months, a boom of plays, music, so it's becoming more fashionable to be in Singapore. Right. You find the most latest thing with Singapore. You find any part of the world. Yeah, okay. All right, so the good news is that VFR will only continue, uh, I say, to, to be strong. VFR is absolute, it's not a new opportunity, but it will still be a very, very big, if not expanded, opportunity in the years to come. So keep on doing what you're doing with, uh, with VFR markets, by, by all means. Now let's uh, let's dive into some some um, outbound segments here, which are more on sort of niche markets, which are uh, quite quite interesting. Now at the moment, women business travellers account for only 23 percent of your outbound um, business traveller. Okay. Now why do we think that? outbound or women in outbound travel will increase. Any viewpoints on that? Let's ask some ladies up here. What's, what's changing or what's going to change with uh, women in India in the next 10, 15, 20 years? I guess a lot more women in higher positions, a lot of single women. Mm -hmm. um, Where? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a good point. Talk about graduates at the moment. Correct. 42% uh, of graduates coming through now uh, would be women, which is a vastly increased uh, percentage. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Women are getting married later, yeah. more single women, and more, I say, higher positions in uh, corporates, which uh, give them the eligibility and the necessity uh, then, then to travel. Also so this is interesting. So you, you've small got small town women coming into, you know, these bigger companies and bigger cities. So you know that also gives them the offer that they're getting more to act. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So at the moment you've got a, approximately one million women travelling ex India for business. Project ahead to 2030, you're going to have 10 million by the uh, extrapolations there. All right. So that's interesting. And I had a discussion yesterday. Uh, with, with somebody involved with, with this report. And uh, I had an idea for a business, and uh, I'll share this with you, jot it down, run away, and make a few million bucks. But re remember me when you do, yeah? Um, and I just think if you look at that with the Indian uh, women, with the Chinese women in the region, et cetera, et cetera, wouldn't it be fantastic to have a chain of hotels which cater exclusively for women business travelers? And you have it right down in the CBD of a Bangkok or a Singapore or a KL or something like that. But you give it the branding, the name, the facilities, the specs, everything uh, that's going to be nice and secure and comfortable for the, the women traveller. You do have women floors. I mean, I see Kolkata, 
Yeah. Yeah. So n now let's. So what would be better? I, I, so I'd be, be interested in your viewpoint. I don't like it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't like to do men's day only. So you don't do the wrong situation. I don't like to be on the floor. That's only for men. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a show of hands uh, of the women of all the women in the room here today. Who would be interested in staying at a women-only hotel? <laughs> There's an honest man there. It's okay, ladies. We'll increase the security. Okay. <laughs> Housekeeping, room service, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was just an ideal, um, a, a, a lazy idea which came out of a discussion on this topic yesterday. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I thought there might be some merit in uh, in discussing that. Now, youth travel. Here we go again. We've already seen that India has this very, very, very young median uh, age, and that will continue. That's not going to change much only by a few years in the next uh, 20 or 30 years, yeah? So youth travel segment. I think the Indian traveler these days is not afraid of going out there on his own, especially for the guys, yeah? Heading out there, just uh, one or two guys heading out doing their own thing. Youth travel market. 32% at that time will be aged between 20 to 39. So once again, adventure products maybe become more to the fore, something that you can think about. Is somebody already catering for youth market or student travel market here? Yeah? Contiki. Oh, Contiki, yeah? Okay, good, yeah. There's been a long standing sort of youth orientated brand. Right, okay. And uh, do, you, do you need security to, uh, <laughs> to, no. to beef up your thing? No. <laughs> You're interested in that demographic? <laughs> oh, he's dreaming already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. How, how do you see the strength of the youth market at the moment and, and what's your forward projection? Uh, I think it's uh, picking up very well, though uh, majorly India was more of family holidays, but it's fast changing where the youth want to travel only with people of their age group and have a ball, apart from seeing the place, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right, sure. Party all the time. Party all the time. Yeah, that's it. Like it's 1499. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyone else got some comments on the youth uh, market at all? Yes, sir. New, uh, Sorry, could you, could you speak up? Uh, it's very into difficult. Into the mic, please. Uh, the, I think the new segment, uh, the Dinks, I think are also part of the youth travel perhaps, uh, or maybe not. The, 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 this segment is also growing very, very fast. Yeah, Dinks, yeah. Double income, no kids, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a, a global uh, phenomenon as people choose that, uh, that lifestyle increasingly. Um, I think, uh, yep. I, I think also what I feel is that the education of the, you know, a lot of people in, I mean, like even taking my age bracket, the aspiration of which is sorry, <laughs> <laughs> still making money. <laughs> so, so the trend is the youth, you know, um, it's it's also because a lot of youngsters out there, they're more educated, they're more travelled now, and uh, you know. Living more, more economically independent. Um, so their aspiration to travel more of the youngsters I've seen more rather to settle down at one place and you know get into a job which when we left at the age of 20, 21 it was just settle down and you know get down to it. I've seen the trend out there because of the education, the higher quality of education and the awareness of the internet and more of the global scenario. Uh, today, I mean like I've seen it with my own eyes, it's happened in my family. I'm like, I, I, my daughter has gone to the US and I told her I'm going to drop purchases no, I'll travel alone. Right. Uh, so it's a big cultural shock or yeah. change or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there, there's something you, you can start thinking about. Somebody was saying that the, um, was the cruise brochures just have the, uh, the old folks in it. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Speaking of cruising, uh, we had a very good panel session this morning. And uh, this, this was... Probably the most surprising thing in all the research that I did through all the McKinsey and the Ernst and Youngs and the CIA and all the different sources of information that I tr trialed through, this to me was the most interesting statistic. That cruising wise, at the moment you ask the Indian traveler what 
you know, uh, what are you interested in? 18% said cruising. Fast forward to 2030, 55%, yeah, is the predicted aspiration. So there's a huge pent-up demand here, folks, and we, we talked about this morning, so we won't labor it. But definitely, I know the Royal Caribbean people are here and a few others. Um, you're in for a really good market. If we can work out some of these issues with domestic uh, uh, use of domestic waters and, and things like that. Um, but uh, cruising is going to be gangbusters. So, and a good commission opportunity, as we learned this morning, money to be made. So uh, I might get into that business, Jan. <laughs> okay. Now, we come to luxury travel. We talked about high net worth individuals before. There will be one million uh, people classified as high net worth individuals uh, traveling out of India in 2030. Okay, and that'll put India only but behind China and Japan in absolute numbers of high net worth individuals traveling. And you know that's that is really that's a that's a huge market. If you're talking about the top end of the market, you know where's uh, where's our banyan tree friends? Um, you know that end of the market. Um, this is big volumes, yeah. Big big volumes to be had at that top end of the market. Anyone here in the luxury sector? Yeah, and and are you finding your your market is uh, picking up at the moment? Oh, very much. Not only luxury. I represent Region Seven Seas in India, and Region belongs to the luxury end of the cruising business. Yeah. Now, besides Region, what I've been witnessing by interacting with my B two C clients, they are even going into yachting, yachting where yachting at our own backyards like <coughs> Phuket. For them, it's a backyard. Yachting in the Mediterranean. So. The trend has already picked up. So if I'm talking about the HNIs, yes, HNIs have even the, the first bracket, the first 100 or 200 bracket, they have even gone beyond what you say about a cruising. They today want a super yacht, all for themselves, going into Monaco or whatever, all the marquee areas. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look into the next level of the HNIs, the, the next rung, the other guys who are looking into luxury cruising. And not only luxury cruising, even we have witnessed a rise in business. I don't do that business, but generally, general in, uh, information. Business in private island uh, hiring, private island holidays. So this is a huge market. The market is growing. The only problem here is that we all need to give a very personalized time to build this business. Time is an essential factor for the trade. If you are interested to build a business, you have to give a personalized time to those clients and build a business. It cannot happen like a volume, like you sit here, you have 100 people today, and tomorrow 50 people, not way, no way at all. You may have 5, 10, but they're going to give you benefits which may be equivalent to that 100 people that you get it straight away. Thank you. Alrighty, good. Oh, excuse now, me. Now, very quickly. Uh, sorry, we're, we're uh, running really tight on time. Very quickly, I'm just going to finish with two slides. This is the Black Swans. I didn't want to spoil the party, but we, as a good journalist, you always have to have a but or a however in your story to make it uh, objective. So whilst you have very good times ahead, what are the things that can derail you? The first is regional instability. And honestly, South Asia is really near the top of the global, uh, if I can use the word shit list, yeah? Yeah, the, the possibility for calamity in terms of security and instability uh, is there, let's say. Yeah? You're, you're aware of that. The next is food and water security. Food require, sorry, uh, yeah, food will be 30% up in terms of demand, the need to feed your population. Water will be something like 35 to 40% up. Where is this going to come from? I see China doing big things specifically around the region and in Africa with getting food security. I don't see India doing that. Jet fuel prices, we touched on that this afternoon with the LCCs. You only need a few percentage points increase in your cost of fuel and there goes your profit margin. All right, That's already hurting the uh, Indian industry up in the last few years. Uh, it remains a spectre uh, because you're Fuel tax prices in this country, your tax on uh, Avgas, about uh, among the highest in the world, yeah? Because you have a state-by-state -state system, as I understand it. 
Next one, visas and credit card. By this, I don't mean visa card, yeah? What I mean is visa, uh, yeah, permission to travel, and credit cards. Now, visas, let's talk only in the outbound context. Don't get me started on inbound. I only just made it here <laughs> with my visa application, right? But outbound, I think uh, India is about 83 on the list of 120 countries in terms of where you cannot go to without a visa. It's really, really, really low, you know? So uh, it causes problems for 10% of leisure travelers and 12% of business travelers report problems with, uh, with visa access, yeah? And credit cards. Did you know that India has only 1% of the penetration of credit cards that the American market has? 1%. So I don't know what that tells me, but it tells me that's a really big opportunity, obstacle to be overcome, especially as we move towards this e-future where everything's uh, getting transacted online. If people don't have a credit card, how can they buy your product or service? Yeah. So big opportunity here for bankers. I'm going to finish on this slide, folks, from Ray Hammond, who uh, has written this book, The World in 2030. And he says, the speed of technological development is accelerating exponentially. There's that word again. And by 2030, it will seem as if a whole century's worth of progress has taken place in the first three decades of the 21st century. So if you're feeling a little bit tired, <laughs> that's why. I say the rate of change is, uh, is just astronomical. We are living through incredibly, extraordinarily uh, once-in-a-lifetime times. With that, I'd like to th thank you very much for your input this afternoon. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. And... Uh, we look forward to 2030, and I hope that uh, the message is very clear as to where you've got to skate towards. And don't forget what? Party like it's... 1499. Come on, party like it's... 1499. Yeah, all right. Thank you, folks. Cheers. I, I must say that I, I met Stu at uh, ATM and uh, we spoke for maybe just 10 minutes and somewhere he believed that this platform was good for him to come and he specially flown in from Thailand today to be with us. Thank you Stu. Thank you.